and we're gonna go ahead and start. So hi everybody, welcome to our Avini Vibes call. This is our Thursday night call where you get to come and see what Avini is health is all about. And we have guest speakers and we have a guest speaker tonight. And I saw him, Thane. Thane. Um, I am here. Hi, welcome, welcome. Um, so this is a lot of my people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and um, so we are excited to have you here tonight. And um, Christine, I'm Thank sorry you. that you cannot <laughs> speak, um, but we are really excited to have everyone because we have several guests here tonight, Bill Spence and Michael Joachim. Thank you. And I'm sure there's a few more and Novella. Um, she's joined us a couple of times. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to bring Thane on. I Thane, I don't know who you are, so I can't actually introduce you. I'm sorry. Can you introduce yourself? Mm -hmm. You are fine. You are quite all right. Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, I live in the thriving metropolis of Shelly, Idaho, which is southeast Idaho. So I, I guess uh, from, from what I hear, we're pretty much covering all over the United States, Florida, New York. Did I hear a couple from Texas as well? Uh, we're stretching all over the nation tonight. That's super cool. So I, um, I'm actually calling or, or joining this Zoom conference from the comfort of my business office. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is what my business office looks like. Uh, it's my backyard. I'm actually sitting under underneath my apple tree in my backyard uh, on a hammock. Hot oh, apple. Yeah. Nice. You know, this is this is so rough. Uh, you know, it, it's it's hard. I don't know if I'm working or playing half the time. So. You know, the, uh, the sun streaks that you see on my face are not me having disease. That's actually the sunlight coming through the leaves on my tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I absolutely love, love, love Avini. Um, I, I got to start off by first off by staying. It, it actually found me. Um uh, uh, Vini is, is something that was brought to my attention three years ago with the product, different company name, but same product. And uh, most of you know Dave Johnson, but uh, Dave contacted me, called me, started telling me about his health issue and everything else. And uh, the very first three-way phone call that Dave ever did with me was with an individual you guys might have heard of. Uh, it was actually Neil Roth. And so Dave did a, a three-way phone call with Neil Roth and, and me. And uh, as Neil was talking more and more about this product, it really, really intrigued me. And uh, as, as I first heard about these products, what they did and things of that nature, I, I started going to the first source that has all the information. Of course, I went to Google. <laughs> and uh, I Googled what are zeolites good for. And right there on that very simple Google search, I happened to come across something that said that uh, zeolite is good for removing heavy toxins and directly assisting and helping people that have autism. And of course, it listed hangovers and a bunch of other things on top of that. Uh, but where that why that grabbed my attention is our son, when he was four years of age, he was actually diagnosed on the spectrum. And... Uh, we tried everything for nine years, my wife and I did, um, to try and help him. And his issue was that uh, he was he was very, very um, tied up, if you will. He was very, um, he struggled a lot to, to be able to communicate and to academically stay on task in school. And uh, part of his level of communication is that he would start and stop, stumble, mumble, and repeat himself. And so a very simple five minute conversation that you and I would have would take him probably a good 20 minutes. And of course, when you're trying to guess what he was trying to say, it would frustrate him or, or confuse him or something of the nature. And then that would slow him down even more so. And uh, anyhow, it was just, it was never fun. It was never, never a good experience like i said he was that way for nine years we tried anything we could find except for medication because we didn't want to fry his little brain and uh as as i was looking at that information right there on the internet you know simply stating that uh zeolite helps 
autism. Um, and of course, Neil, he shared the, the four main things that I love sh sharing with people. One, 15 clinical trials showing that it works, peer reviewed by the AMA and FDA, which really grabbed my attention. Three, that there's zero negative side effects. And at the same point in time, um, with Rick offering a 30 day money back guarantee, I thought, oh my goodness, everything to gain, nothing to lose. We know we can't hurt him. So my wife and I, we, we ordered a bottle and uh, started giving it to Carter, not even knowing what to expect or what kind of time frame to expect it in. And we just started giving him uh, 10 drops anywhere from two to three times a day. And uh, it was two weeks and three days later, he came up and started talking to me. And I noticed that he was just very concise in what he wanted to say. He was right there. Uh, no start, no stumble, no mumble, no repeat. You know, uh, it was just very, very easy for him to get out what he wanted to say. And it was, it was mind blowing. I just thought, oh my goodness. I looked at my wife and I said, are, are you, are you hearing exactly what I'm hearing? Are you seeing this? Is it just me noticing this? And she says, no, she says, uh, the other day he actually went to my wife and said, mom, I've noticed ever since I've started taking that. I can put my thoughts and ideas into words quicker and easier. And so he became self-aware of his own ability to, to portray and convey the message that he had to share. And that just blew my mind, absolutely blew my mind. And so much so, you know, here we are, uh, almost three years. In fact, next month will be three years that Carter has been taking Rick Deitch's Cell Defender product. And uh, anyhow, we were not too long ago down in Burley and Rupert area. In fact, I've actually invited a good friend of mine to be on this Zoom with me and rosh me. You know, you, you got a chance to see it firsthand. But anyhow, uh, there was a woman in the audience whose son is 24 and he was diagnosed with the same type of issue. And she says, you know, my son, you know, he can talk to him and everything else. But in process of time, you can see him boil and boil and boil and just get more and more aggravated and, and to the point to where he'd look down, maybe his shoe to be untied or maybe his sister would ask him a question and it would just set him off and he would explode. And anyway, she, she was telling me a story of how she actually, her and her husband bought all of their kids a laptop for a graduating present as they graduate high school. And so they bought their son this laptop and it was everything that he wanted, everything that he wanted. And uh, he was he was sitting at the dinner table at one point in time playing a video game on his laptop and his sister was talking to him and she could see that his her son was getting fidgety and antsy. And so it was all the calling signs of him getting close to just having an explosion. And she did or said something that upset him and he grabbed his computer, his laptop, and he just threw it on the floor in a rage. And he could not even really fathom and as far as what was really going on until it hit the floor. And of course it shattered into a million pieces. And as she, you know, as, as he stopped a couple of seconds after it happened, as he realized what he had just done, he immediately burst out into tears, realizing that he had just destroyed his most prized possession. But in his anger, in his rage and his autistic issue, it didn't register to him what he had done until it had already happened. And that was, gosh, what was it like two, three weeks ago, I believe it was. And she called me just a couple of days ago and she says, my son is a lot more even keel now. You can tell that he is not having those fits of rage, that he is not walking on eggshells all the time, as she put it, because now he's able to think more concise to calm down and be able to work through all these situations and scenarios that would easily upset him in the past. And as, as, as she was telling me these stories at one point in time, it was really sad and really heart wrenching to hear as she told through a great deal of emotion, but she said her son looked at her at one point in time and said, mom, I've just become like Hulk. I'm easy to set off. I am nothing more than a rage monster. I can't control myself. And here he is, 24 years old. And he says, I don't trust myself around anybody else. And here's this young man, 24 years of age. And now he's starting to get hope. 
now he's starting to actually see and be able to work through all these issues that would easily beset him and set him off. Mm. And now they're not. And the other thing that was quite fascinating is at one point in time, of course, he was only taking it a couple, two, three days in. And he just said, Mom, this stuff isn't working. So then I did a three-way phone call with Robin West. And Robin, of course, told her story about her two great nephews and how it took a couple of months, or excuse me, a couple of weeks for their boys to start seeing a difference. And so it encouraged her to be able to continue taking. And the reason I'm telling the story is because Rashmi, the woman who is on the line with us, she's the connecting link. And so the beautiful thing about all of this is if it wasn't for Rashmi, we wouldn't have reached out to this mom and her 24 year old son. And that is what we have right before us is the beautiful thing of connection, the opportunity to share a message of hope, to be able to reach out to people that have children that are stuck in this situation, you know, and, and it was really, really beautiful as well, because as, as we were there at that meeting and this, this mother, I can't remember her name. I apologize. But as we were sitting there, or excuse me, as we were doing this meeting, I actually invited my son to come up he's 16 years old now. And she says, now, what is his sensory processing abilities? How fast can he process? Because with, with children that have this type of, of autistic diagnosis, you'd ask him a question and it was almost like it didn't register, but yet they're slowly thinking about what's going on. And the beautiful thing about it is, as, as she asked me, how fast can Carter process questions right there in front of everybody unscripted? I looked at Carter and I said, who's your best friend? How long have you known him? They just recently moved. Where did they move to? How long have they been there? What's his phone number? And he just was rattling off these questions just as fast as he could. And here's this mother in the audience. And she turned to me and she's just like, my goodness, if, if my son has this possibility of what your son is now experiencing, that would be huge. Mm. so all the way around you know and i don't i don't know what other what other questions you may have for me or what other stories you may wish to hear but the beautiful thing about what this is and i i want to try and go off on a little bit of a tangent and chip if if you're on you're welcome to to come in and maybe to perhaps smack me around a little bit because i'm going to walk this fine line i don't think you can hear me right you, yes, we can hear oh, you. Oh, Christine, oh, there you my are. Oh, goodness. I've been on since 10 after 7 early, too. I'm an early bird, and my sound wouldn't work, so I do apologize. I don't know what went wrong. Everything was working uh, before, but hello, 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 Thane. Uh, thank <laughs> you. Thank you for joining us, and uh, again, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Carol, thanks for jumping in, and and I'm, you know, maybe I, I know a little sign language, but not enough to do what you just said. <laughs> So, but I asked Chip also, I want Chip to comment, but I want to ask you a question also, Thane. There was a little girl, I watched the video. I'm very familiar with autism. I was the director of school and I had 140 okay. students, zero to six. Um, not all of them were on the spectrum, early intervention. Many of them were on, uh, probably about 70 were on the spectrum, early intervention again. And we did one-on-one -on -one ABA, we did a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, for the parent like yourself that's telling this story my goodness the hope because it's very very difficult i watched my own nephew through the years of the impact that this aut that autism being on the spectrum has the impact on a family so thank you for who shared with you because again it's it's more than hope it, it's real right Oh, but, yeah. um, but totally. i wanted to ask you there was a one little girl that you told a story about ray of hope i think her name was Oh, Raya, um, Raya? Raya. You shared a little bit about her. How's she doing? And maybe you could just uh, touch base on that. And then I'd like to have Chip comment as well, please. Yeah. So Raya, uh, it's kind of an interesting name. I love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, they actually named her Raya because her mother, Caitlin, uh, actually struggled with fertility for a very long period of time. And uh, when they found out that uh, Caitlin was pregnant again, uh, when Raya was born, they didn't have a name picked out for her yet. 
And when she was born, she had a fragile chromosome. I, she didn't have, she wasn't diagnosed with downs or anything of the nature. I can't actually name what it was, what she was diagnosed with. But anyhow, the interesting thing about it is mentally, she just was not developing. And uh, Rhea, uh, the doctor said, you know, because of her, her condition and things of that nature, they told her that she wouldn't live much beyond three years of age. And here she is four. But the doctors were blown away at the fact that she actually survived childbirth um, because she her her first few months of life was fraught with major, major difficulty. And uh, anyhow, um, they they the doctors basically prepared her, you know, said, hey, we're going to send you home. But just just be aware that your daughter might die any month now. And like I said, here she is four years old now. But uh, the interesting thing about it is Raya. Uh, with her with her chromosome issues, you know, she was having uh, kidney and liver failure. Um, she also was having developmental delays and things of that nature. But um, the the big issue with Raya is she never really had any sense of adventure. You know, you think about a four year old child; they would uh, sit down and play with their toys randomly. They would make sounds and babble throughout the house. You know, and and uh, Caitlin shared with me that uh, Raya, you know, at the 18 month old time frame or two year time frame, when most kids start to talk, Raya never did. Mm -hmm. And so all these years, Raya never spoke. She never slept. Um, she would basically catnap throughout the night. But uh, Raya, when I met Caitlin, um, I actually, you know, she, she got a pack. She actually got the seven bottle pack and things of that nature. Started giving Raya, um, uh, the, the cell defender, the drops. And, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know how or why, but Raya being so small, um, when Caitlin gave her, I think it was three drops the very night, uh, she actually slept 12 hours straight. She went to bed at seven o'clock that evening, woke up seven o'clock the next morning. And she always woke up mom or dad throughout the entire night. And it was almost two to three hour schedule. So like I said, she just catnapped for, for four years. She didn't really sleep all night long. Um, but not only that, though, um, <clears throat> with Raya, her two younger siblings, um, not understanding what was going on, Raya had a very, very short fuse as well. So she was er easily agitated and irritated. And uh, Raya had actually hurt her two younger siblings, not fully um, aware of what she was doing, not understanding. And so, uh, you know, Caitlin always had to be on guard, making sure that Rhea didn't hurt her two younger sisters. But uh, not only that, though, but she noticed the next morning, the following morning, that Rhea was more patient, more peaceful, more calm. And uh, her sister, she wasn't she wasn't getting upset at her younger sisters as she was going about her morning routine and everything else. And not only that, though, but at one point in time, um, Rhea was babbling and Caitlin noticed that she had never done that before. And so she looked over at Rhea and saw Rhea sitting on the couch with a book in her lap. And as Rhea was kind of fumbling through these pages, she was kind of, you know, making up her own little storyline to go with the pictures of the book. And Rhea had never done that before ever in her life. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, Caitlin told me about a week later I guess there's a, a specific type of, of schooling that uh, Caitlin takes Raya to. And um, <laughs> Caitlin dropped off Raya and, um, you know, walked, a, you know, Raya walked a couple of steps away from her and everything else towards her school. And she stopped about five, six feet away. And she turned around, looked at her mommy and waved and said, bye bye. Oh, and that was her goodness. few words. Oh, thank God. That's so, crazy. I mean you hear stories like this it just melts your heart and you've got to get it out there you got to share it um i just had a friend of mine just call me up i haven't connected with since uh gosh fall of last year so it's been about six seven months since we've talked and he's got some digestive issues and things of that nature and i've got a good friend of mine that lives down in littlefield arizona we just did a, a three-way phone call right there and i just said hey baron you know uh I, I don't want to push anything on you. I'm just a messenger. But I know you've struggled with this digestive complication for, for the past five, six years that I've known you. Do you want to know more? And Baron said, yeah, 
absolutely. I'm calling you after the 4th of July. We need to connect and I need to know. And it, you know, it just, it just fell in my lap, but story after story, possibility after possibility, hope after hope. But the one thing, Christine, I want to share, and I want everybody on this zoom, because this is the first thought that I have actually started putting together and Chip can verify this if you'd like. Okay. Christine, I want to, I want to ask you this as a question. Okay. How many, I'm not going to mention any specifically, but how many infectious diseases do we really have? In other, in other words, if you think about, if you think about the top four killers of Americans today, okay, you know what I lied. Well, I'm going to name them one by one: heart attack, cancer, stroke, and diabetes. Okay, when was the last time an individual sneezed on an airplane, and everybody on that airplane developed cancer? That's never been documented. It's never happened. Okay, so that proves that cancer is not an infectious disease. Okay, same point in time. When was the last last time somebody grabbed a uh, a, a handle on a doorknob? And because of of the stuff or the the contamination that was on that doorknob, when was the last time somebody had a stroke because they came across a virus that was on that doorknob? That's never happened. Okay. So in other words, the point I'm trying to make is the issues that we're having today. They're not infectious diseases. They're environmental diseases. Okay. I'm not a doctor, but it just causes an individual to stop and think. When was the last time somebody actually bumped into or or got scratched by a rusty nail and developed diabetes? That's never happened either. You see what I mean? So why then do we all of a sudden think that medically we have to treat all of these diseases with pharmaceuticals when it's not the lack of pharmaceuticals that caused us to develop these issues in the first place? Question. Very good question. You know, makes you think, right? Makes you realize. Yeah. Yeah. So. That, that's just a, a very, very simple rant, but I'm, I'm starting to ask people this question. You know, um, well, I might... wonder why I live in a hotbed of autism. I live, I grew up in New Jersey and I live in a hotbed and I've been around autism a long time. My son, my nephew was diagnosed with autism 32 years ago. Uh, ABC did a, a video on him, uh, followed him when he was three and a half, when he was seven and a half, they came back. They came back when he was 18 and did another documentary. I can share it at some point. Um, Unfortunately, I have a family member that she's not open yet. So you're going to face that too. You know, you're going to face that. Although we've all been as family members, we're all trained and many, many, um, listen, we've been to every possible training on autism for 30 years because that's just the type of person she is. She's a law professor. She's a front runner, I want to say, is a speaker in this field at the UN speaking you, uh, autism. But I might need Chip to talk to her <laughs> <laughs> instead of me, the messenger. I'm the, I'm the sister, you know. But I just say that because sometimes the closest people to us, you may have the answer and they're not, you know, might not be willing to listen to you personally but i want to bring on a third party right now like i want to bring on chip and let chip jump in what is that you have on your head i'm curious chip. Yeah, me too <laughs> what's going on hi, hi everybody uh actually invented this it says uh, zoom glasses oh my zoom glasses, <laughs> zoom glasses? yeah <laughs> so um you know as, as you age uh, you have uh, gradient lenses and I found that in order to see you and your expressions which is very interesting to me um, the part of my glasses that was most functional was way at the bottom and so everybody would say when you're on these zoom calls why do we only see up your nostrils Mm, you got progressives exactly I have those too almost killed myself walking down the stairs with first time I wore them but go ahead yeah yeah exactly so um Essentially, this is uh, uh, um, for people who do fine close-up work, and I, I picked it up. Um, I picked it up one day uh, at a at a tool store. 
Um, every, everybody's heard of Harbor Freight, I suppose, right? Yeah. So if you go to Harbor Freight, and so now I can, I can look at you guys, um, and I, I just put it on partly for effect, you know, one of the things that you have to do in order to be involved in network marketing is, is you have to get people to, to stop for a second and think like, okay, what's going on? Or made you look, you know, but, but this actually works. I mean, it actually works great. So I'm, I'm watching how many people on this call are bobbing their head. Yes. Uh, that know about the topic that we're speaking about. And I don't know if we intended for this to be a call specifically about, you know, uh, arrested or delayed development in children. Um, but I've been with Thane's son's, uh, Thane's son Carter uh, when he came home from school one night in the after picture. Mm -hmm. I'd heard him tell the story as it happened. What a charming young man. Mm. I, I would say in, in all of my um, Rick Deitch autism related experiences, which are extensive, would be thousands of people by now, Christine. So that I think that would give me credibility with your sister. <laughs> One of the most um, enchanting moments was, was just having Carter come home from school. And, and he struck up conversation with me. And I asked him, you know, uh, like a lot of times adults will ask your children, you know, what was your day like at school? And he started telling me. And he started telling me about um, a presentation that he was preparing. And, uh, you know, just the things that happened in his day. It's not like so many times a, a child would give you a very um, terse answer like, I don't really want to talk about it. And I definitely don't want to talk with you about it. He, he did want to talk and he did want to talk with me about it. And to the point that um, we had to go and make a presentation that night, uh, Thane and I did. It was kind of an interesting thing because where we were going to go speak, just to give you an idea how, ubiqui how ubiquitous this problem is, uh, Thane and I were going to go speaking at a Denny's out by the interstate. And this was during the time when people were having trouble getting staffing. And the last time that Thane had scheduled a meeting there, it didn't happen because there wasn't a staff, wasn't a staff to open the restaurant. And so I, I got to town early to spend some time with Thane and, and uh, went in the door. And as I recall, the, the, the woman greeted me and she was very personable had no idea where this was going to go, but she was the manager of Denny's um, for that evening. And her name was Julie. Is that right, Thane? That is correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, Thane had told me they were having trouble getting people to work and that he had checked on it several times during the week ahead of time to make sure they were going to be there. Little did I know, I mean, you, you meet people and you think, okay, everybody's, you know, everybody's doing fine. And of course, um, when you're at work, like she was, you put on a happy face and you act like you're going to be prepared to put on the, uh, you know, the, the meal that night and, and to host a meeting. And she did. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, if you're, if you're working a group of people, one of the concerns is that um, maybe the tip won't be very good if it's a group meeting. And, and so just, you know, just knowing the situation, I just handed her $100 and I said, this is um, a thank you for being here with your crew tonight. And if you would, you know, just let them know, I don't know what you're going to get, but, but whatever it is, here's a bit more. Well, as we put on the, the presentation, um, and we got to the end of it. I, I was kind of the keynote speaker that night. Sitting right in front of me um, was a chiropractor. Who, it was his first night. And I, I take a lot of notes. And this guy was, was just really um, writing down every single thing I said and paying attention like he may never get another chance to learn it. But, uh, and I just kind of went through the regular stuff. And then it came time to close the meeting. 
And Thane brought up a family that was in the meeting. It was mom and dad and a son. And this was their story. Probably one of the most intense ones that I've ever, ever heard, Christine. This little boy wasn't just slow to develop. He was deeply angry. And he's there at that meeting that night. Well, if you understand anything about those kids, they don't go to meetings. They don't go to stores. They don't go to restaurants. If it's like whatever it is, one in 40 or one in 30 of our children today are winding up on that spectrum, well, why doesn't everybody know about this? I mean, you would think that'd be obvious if that was big, that big of a deal, right? You'd see kids blowing up, uh, you know, in every restaurant and every store. What happens is that the child and a caregiver disappear from view, mm -hmm. right? So if I were talking to Christine's sister, these are the kinds of things I would say because maybe everybody knows it, but nobody says it mm -hmm. because if the child goes away and a caregiver goes away, they, they, they both just went below the radar. And, and nobody knows this is happening or, or only the people who are immersed in it know that it's happening. So what is it that's happening? When I was a, a young dad, um, my kids were in Christian school. Uh, we got kicked out of Christian school along with several other families because one of the resource instructors had to take a main classroom. There just wasn't enough uh, instructors for all the classrooms. And so they simply didn't have enough people to deal with my son's reading disability. Mm -hmm. but, but when I was there, I would go every Wednesday afternoon and do kind of like a Mr. Wizard, something about science. And one of the kids, Creighton Booth, apparently had this kind of a problem. And I was actually speaking to them one day and Creighton, who I knew well, he was kind of like a buddy with my kid, was on the edge of this problem. And we're, we're on an upper floor of this building. He goes over and climbs up on the counter and starts crawling out the window, literally crawling out the window. And, uh, I'm kind of an old fashioned kind of a guy. And, uh, you know, I reverted back to my typical behaviors. Uh, my, my mom who uh, passed at the age of 94, uh, born in 1924, um, used to say that my, she, you could always tell my kids because they had a bright red handprint uh, looked just like that on their butt. And, and I, I I, you know, we, we still joke about it. I mean, it was always um, to prevent them from something bad happening. Where's the big alley? You know, don't jump off of that. Don't fall out of the hot tub, you know, whatever it is that you're going to hit on the concrete, whatever it was. Um, and, and, and anyway, I, I, I grabbed Creighton by the foot and s smacked him on the butt. Well, you can't get away with that these days. I'm pretty sure you can't get away with it then. But you talk about... Uh, the, the, the most screeching silence from a classroom you ever heard. And, and uh, Creighton and I, interestingly enough, to, to this day are still buddies. These kids are 32 now. And, uh, but, but it caused me to start reading because if we would go out on a field trip, all the parents and the teachers were following Creighton and all the other kids were, you know, on their own to deal with their own behavior. It was that big of a deal. So I don't know, Christine, if that sounds like your world or not. And it's probably not the proper approach, but it certainly uh, worked with him. If, if you were on a field trip, uh, I don't care where you were, Creighton had come back with like something like a, a, a needle or a, a used condom or something. I don't know where he found these things, but 
he'd find stuff like that and, and bring it to everybody's attention. I mean, that, that's just the, the way it was. And so I, I found a book uh, in, in a Christian bookstore. It was a pink covered book. And what I saw in there uh, that jumped out at me the most was one of these kids wrote a letter after he was an adult. And the thing that jumped out at me about his letter was, I knew I was going to do something, but I couldn't stop myself. Mm. I knew there were going to be consequences, but I couldn't stop myself. And so all these years later, here comes a beanie. And comes one Saturday morning. Phone rings. I'm brand, brand new. I don't know who the brand newliest of all of you are, but I was that brand new. And we just started reaching out to everybody and just wondering, you know, what would this do? Because I saw the idea and I saw, okay, this guy, this biochemist, everything I ever learned before about nutrition was the building blocks of good health. Even energy stuff, exercise, spiritual things, um, family things, you know, relationship things, those were all building blocks of good health. This was the first guy I ever ran into who was removing the stumbling blocks that mm-hmm. kept that from fitting together properly. Okay. And I, my, my first impression, it was like the scales were taken off of my eyes. When I saw what Rick Deitch was doing with his zeolite product, I thought, oh my gosh, this might be the most important thing I've ever read because everything is going to start working right at once every metabolic process, every tissue, every thought, every developmental pathway is going to start working as it should have. And so on this Saturday morning, the phone rings and I picked it up and it was a mother in tears. And I thought, oh my goodness, what, what's happened? And she said, it's my son. I said, I thought, oh, I thought this is serious. And uh, I said, well, what happened? She said he picked up a tractor and he headed off across the rug making tractor noises. Uh, And I thought to myself, okay, this isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And and so I actually asked her, I said, well, is that a bad thing? Because she was crying. And she then she really burst into tears. She says he's never done anything like that before. Wow, that's remarkable. First words or... First association, you know, it's such a, a debilitating uh, issue that parents, I mean, you just said it, like I know going personally through it with, you know, can't go to restaurants, can't go to this, can't go to that. So often invite them to family parties. No, we can't go. We can't go because of Andrew, you know, and um, so many families deal with that. So that is, I feel the, 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 the blessing that we've all been giving to share and share what you just told us, you know, if I've heard, uh, this is a while when I was at the third, you know, I ran the therapeutic riding center, the horseback riding center. I remember one uh, little boy said, great pony. Those were his first words. Well, you know, I'm going back to that person and share this with them. And I think we do all have a duty to, to do that because it is, it's a epidemic. You know, there's so many theories of what causes it. I have my own personal theory. I won't put it on the zoom call here. But um, it's, you know, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's God's miracle. God's miracle for sure. Christine, so. if you don't mind, and I know you're recording this call, may I, may I please take this a little deeper sure, so that everybody please. understands? It, it's not a mystery anymore. No. You know, I, I know, I absolutely know what's happening. And in a couple of minutes, all of you will know too. Anytime you harm someone's brain, it's predictable the things that are gonna be lost. Everybody here has probably been around someone who was drunk. And so what happens is alcohol rides on the hemoglobin instead of oxygen, and you have an oxygen deprived brain. That's one way of harming a brain. It's one that we use because people will come back you know, from it in 24 hours. But when you do that, the very first things that are lost right off of the top, no matter whether a brain is hit 
or drugged or, or, or what happens or toxic. I believe that humans are unintentionally intoxicated. They act as though they are slightly inebriated all the time. Our interaction with each other, and I think it's everybody, you lose right off the top. The highest levels of brain function are the filters, which are inhibitions and judgment. Okay, what's right below that? Some people are cute and warm and cuddly, but others are frustrated and angry. Uh, this young man artist that was at the meeting that night with uh, Thane, um, he was angry. He was so angry that they had told him, we are not providing him any more services. We're going to take the other two older sisters out of the home because they're in danger to this young boy who's, I don't know, five, six years old. He was that bad. So that was what was right below the surface for him. Now I'm looking at him, he's in the meeting. Thane's son just was developmentally slow as far as speech and that sort of thing. So what happens, you know, I love the pony story um, because that first statement, oftentimes that very first statement will be, I love you. And not far behind that very often will be singing or saying the ABCs. Chip, excuse me. Talk over and over and over. Yeah. Yeah. Who have I got? You got Alan Way here, Chip. Um, yeah. A moment ago, before you leave that thought about alcoholism, yep. is there a potential link between <clears throat> the use of uh, our products and alcoholism that would possibly reverse that? Well, it's easier for people to step away from something they've been using for a crutch if they can get where they wanted to go and that's the reason they were using it. Um, and I, I probably could deal with that more later. The very first I ever learned about that was with professional cowboys at the National Western Stock Show and they were trying to quit chewing. I'd had a booth there for many years and they came by and, and I, th this is the first, you know, uh, months of having uh, Rick's Zeolite. And I said, here, try this. Well, it came back later in the week and said, yeah, that, that's working. That's easier. Well, the next thing that happened, I get a call from a mom in Hawaii whose daughter's in prison, pregnant, addicted to meth. And she said, have you got anything to help me? And I told her the cowboy story. So that's as close as I got. Well, eventually the child was born with a high APGAR, not a meth baby. Uh, mom, grandma, and, and baby went on, you know, happy as they could be. And so that was, I mean, that's quite a jump, but this is product discovery stuff. You guys are all, you know, you know, maybe a, I've seen you guys a couple of times or talked to you once or twice, but you're in the early stages of product discovery here. You know, you, you're, you come across somebody like Thane, who's, who's like a, a lightning rod for miracles. You hear him tell the stories that he's participated in. And, and they're just astonishing. But they're going to happen for you too. The miracles aren't going to quit happening just because it's you offering them. It's not going to quit just because Christine's sister picks it up and bravely, I mean, think she's got her, I'm sure she feels like her uh, identity maybe even on the line, not just her reputation, but who she is as a credible person in the world of autism. She's got her name on the line and, and she brings up something out of network marketing. Well, this is where it is. Why is it here? It's because our biochemist loves to meet you guys. He loves to hear these stories in person. And once he got a taste of that, he really um, always had to have an association with networking and brings us the leading products in his life. And that's what Avini is. And so, um, just a little bit deeper into the brain. As you go further forward and hurt the brain even more, inhibitions, judgment, short-term memory, fine motor skills, and it gets worse and worse and worse, what are the last two things that a brain gives up? Remember, it's highly plastic. It'll keep reassigning everything. And the last two things a human brain will give up 
our long-term memory. That's the answer to how can a memory sh so short go back so far? It's literally the design of the brain. It will give up short-term memory quickly and hang on to long-term memory till the very, very last moment. There's only one thing that the, the brain protects even more than long-term memory. And if you've ever been around somebody who was saying the slow goodbye, you know, we have code names for diseases because we can't say the real name of the disease, but what would be called the slow goodbye? It's when someone's brain has not given up organ function. You might see a perfectly healthy functional body, but the person and the personality are gone. Yeah. And they're in an institution because everything else is gone. That's the long term that you might call that late autism, you know, or something like that. That's where it ultimately can wind up if you keep hurting the brain that way. So here we bring people back to the ultimate highest level of their function. You're going to get uh, access to parts of yourself. You'll be able to have mental files open and be able to access um, whatever you need out of them whenever you need it. Whether it's athletically, working this business, um, writing, thinking, dealing with other people, uh, those are the kinds of things that Avini is bringing to you tonight. Mm -hmm. Dip, I have a I have a son that uh, ex had a motorcycle accident on his 21st birthday right out my driveway. He was home from college, broke his back, and had a traumatic brain injury. So I remember in this very room, standing in this very room with him, uh, it's white now, this is his room, this is studio now, but he didn't, um, he was a different person. It's been 10 years now. And, uh, you know, he stood, he didn't talk, he had to learn everything over and over. I wish I had a Vini then, but I have a Vini now. And my son, Ryan, is now on the cell defender. And I wish he could walk in the door now because he walks, he talks, he drives, he paints, he's in college. And it's, uh, you know, the brain, like you said, is miraculous. It took time to get it back to where he is today. He is a different person, but he started using the cell defender um, just four weeks ago. And that's one of the things he shared with me. He said, wow, well, I'm like, cool, this is good. I can focus, you know, uh, instead of meds, instead of medication. So that smile, I, I hope everybody saw the smile on Christine's face right there. That's that's a window into her soul. Oh. Um, and it's part of the reason she knows so much about this. Uh, the reason I know so much about it is my son, who wound up being salutatorian of his class with that problem, and my daughter, who was run over by an escaped Brahma bull right when she graduated from high school, oh, as she was being introduced as Miss Nebraska. Or actually, Miss Scott's Bluff. She was standing next to the woman who was Miss Nebraska, also co-salutatorian of their class with my son, she became Miss America. One more girl down the line, no Miss America from Scott's Bluff. Oh. Teresa Scanlon, 2010 Miss America. Oh. Because my daughter couldn't remember, she went to college and couldn't remember if she'd been to class or not. Oh. No, it's- Six years. But the well, brain I think, I think... figured out. I think it's another another topic. We did talk about people on the spectrum on tonight's call, but you know, we could go through each each one of the indexes on the spreadsheet that we have about the issues that each one of us personally know and feel. And that's what I think that, you know, we're all called to speak to the people that have any of those issues and some, because we do need to deliver this product, uh, the cell defender, the other products that uh, that Rick, I mean, Rick is, he is, he's brilliant. I'm learning more and more about Rick. For those of you, if you're a guest, uh, if you're on here new, you know, he jumped on a call this week. Eddie, where's Eddie? We don't have a whole lot of time, but Ed Kowalski, can you just jump on with us for a minute and just share with us about um, the great opportunity you had this week to work with uh, with Rick and Doug, uh, our oh, vice president? That's yeah. an amazing story. Yeah, I'm can recording you hear me? it, so I was in the back and recording it, but that blew me away, the brilliance of, of Rick and the team. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Ed. Go oh, ahead. okay. Yeah, it was, um, we have a, a distributor in our organization, and his child has, uh, you know, a lot of issues, so I called Doug Dickey, and we set up a call. Christine recorded the call, and 
So um, <laughs> Hirsch is throwing out these questions to Doug and Doug is brilliant. And, uh, and, and he kind of knew what he wanted to answer with, but he wasn't positive. So he sabotages Rick <laughs> without Rick knowing that he was about ready to step into this. And so Rick comes on and the brilliance behind that call, it gives me chills just to tell the story because Hirsch was told by his father, find, search the globe to find a cure, something that can give our son a normal life, or your son, my grandson. And so anyway, so Rick steps into that and Hirsch had been to doctors and, and Christine knows the, the hospital's up there in New York, I'm in Florida. But Columbia uh, went to Cincinnati, the best of the best. And, you know, and no one really addressed the root cause, the source of what was going on. And so Rick was kind of blindsided, but he powered through it and he was looking at stuff, you know, on the spot. And he found a few things and he said there and he gave Hirsch hope. And not only did he give Hirsch hope, hope Hirsch was so excited just to have someone say, yeah, we need to get to the root. We need to get to the source, not put band-aids on the symptoms. And so, so at the end of the call, Rick said, you know, we're going we're gonna to figure this out. You know, I'll do my research. Make sure you have my email. Let's stay in touch. That's Rick Deitch. And the creator and the only thing out there that anyone, you know, anyone that, that is, what does it say, a uh, womb to the tomb? I know Chip says something like, I don't know, what is it? Uh, Conception, creation. So, to creation. There Pretty you amazing. go. Thanks, Chip. Yeah. So, so yeah, it was a tremendous call. And literally the text from Hirsch texted me right afterwards. He said, thank you 10,000% and for this Avini family, something to that effect. Because now he's got everybody that he he sees everybody pulls together to help one another and that's that's what makes all this worth it amen thank you thank you so much and um i think we're approaching the end of hour so i we want to respect your time does anyone want to say anything before we go and i thank you chip for being with us and thane thank you looking forward to meeting the two of you in person in dallas in october a bunch of us will be there so we're grateful for that carol you have anything to share no, I just want to thank my guests for coming to see what Avini is all about. Bill and Michael, thank you, thank you, thank you. And Novella, uh, Novella just uh, became a distributor of the pro, um, of Avini. Yay! So she's brand new um, and in Texas. Yeah. So Wonderful. yeah. Wonderful. So anyway. hey, Chris, real quick, something I want to add. Yeah. I did send, I did text you two pictures. I don't know if you got them yet um, on your phone. You're welcome to share those with anybody and everybody you want. Chip touched on this story, but they are actual pictures of artists. This little boy that was so violently autistic. He was told that he was the most violent case that his caseworkers had ever seen in 30 years. Wow. wow. And they, they actually blackballed him. Those caseworkers called everybody else in the southeastern Idaho area and said, hey, if Brad or Alexa Coleman ever call you, do not accept their son because he is too violent to take care of. I, I did. I did get it. Thank you. I will share them. And, you know, that's one of the things as a director of a school, when I was at the school, you know, we would get a child's history and you look at their, you know, their history and all and, and dealing with my sister, just the things she would deal with because she's an, she's an attorney in this field. You know, you get the phone call of their called right behaviors. The child is self-injurious. The child is hurting other people. The child is, it's just horrific. It's horrific. Mm -hmm. I can't even tell you, I could stay on here and tell you 50 stories in the next hour, but Thank you for sharing because we have something that we can help those families. There's sometimes there's no hope for them. None. Zero. I would take the phone calls myself. When we shut the what? doors down at that school for COVID, believe me, they were banging on the doors and needed to come in because a one-on-one, -on -one, they're called DSPs, a direct service provider. That parent drops the child off at the school. That DSP is with that child for the next seven hours working one-on-one. -on -one trying to work through whatever methodology they use. Da Dr. Danielle was on earlier. I saw her uh, from Baby Steps to Literacy. She had to jump off, but love to have her come back on and tell you some of the uh, the success stories. But 
thank you each of you for you know being with us tonight. I'm very, very grateful. And sorry I had the technical issues earlier, but I knew Carol could jump in. She's our tech gal. <laughs> she <laughs> came to the rescue. <laughs> I, I would just encourage audience. people because I know there's so many of you that are brand, brand new. Um, what we're speaking of today is predictable. It's dependable. It takes a very short time and a small amount of product for these things to start unwinding, especially in the young ones. And it is very, very rewarding. Mm. You know what yeah, I would I love, love to do, Chip? Yeah. I'd like to um, have Marcy come on again or or and yourself to talk about, um, you know, the the birth moms, what moms deal with umbilical cord, you know, that whole process. I think that's another thing because you have you and Marcy. I understand when I spoke to Marcy, there's a lot of amazing stories that could be shared. And um, I'd love to get that scheduled. Well, the resolution we're working with, just so everybody understands real quickly, we are polluted in mass and it hurts us more than you'd think. Some people are closer to the edge than others. We are cleaned up, deep cleaned, one at a time through a being. And it makes a huge difference. Everybody is afflicted. Some are really, really hurt to the point they fall off the edge. And so I, I, I could not overstate how important you being here tonight is. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful that you're here. And uh, that's it. Thanks for coming. I hope you feel like what you've run into tonight is of great, great value to you and all humans. Absolutely. Thank you, Chip. Amen. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Zane. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Everyone, uh, just if you're a guest, get with the person who invited you. And we're here every Thursday night uh, to share. Okay. So. We'll look forward to seeing you next Thursday night as well, 7.30. God bless. I'll, I'll make sure you get this recording, Christine. Very good. Thank you, Carol. All right. Thanks to all. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye